Hi, I'm Lucas. And I'm Brian. And this is the Quacks Podcast. We got, we got a show to do. All right, let's do the podcast. You ready? Yeah. Cool. So, what are we doing today? We're going to do some stories from you about Hagar and... Uh, whatever else you want to share. And I have a story from CNN that's an amazing story. Okay. So it's just going to be a chill story day. We'll just ping pong. Yep. Okay. Um, do you want to start off with your Sammy Hagar story? Or what was the other story? You had a you had a Tom Cruise story, I think. I've got a few. Well, I was... my I like At 17 years old, I got my dream job, and I was an intern at Paramount Pictures Studios. Wow. <clears throat> yeah finagled it because i got out there my dad's a guy that my dad helped out business wise his brother was like some vp at paramount got me a job as an intern okay got there junior year before going into senior year of high school 17 years old they asked for my id and they're like as everybody knows at orientation you got to be 18 years old to be and i go <gasps> And I go, I forgot my license because I'm like, I'm not, I'm not giving <laughs> nice. up on this. So back in the day, you could do this. But my dad, I go, Dad, this is happening. They're not going to let me have the internship. I got to be 18 to work there and I got to bring some kind of ID tomorrow. So he faxed a copy of my birth certificate and fudged, white outed the numbers and faxed it over. Oh, my gosh. And it, and it worked. Genius. That was back then. It was like archaic. It was ditto machines and craziness. So, wow. and that was it. So I was the youngest person actually employed by Paramount Pictures at that summer. So nice. I got to see everybody from like Jack Nicholson to I met Tom Hanks and Bruce Willis, and it was a cool, magical. It was actually the high point of my life. So everything since then has been. <laughs> steadily trickling downward <laughs> no no it was good stuff but no the the story that you were alluding to was like i used to work on this this one uh show that was we were traveling it was a reality kind of television game show and and we were traveling around the country i was on a different flight every week i was somewhere else <clears throat> for like a year and a half pardon me and uh so anyways i'm on this flight from la to san francisco and I see Sammy Hagar, the lead singer of Van Halen. Yeah. When I'm going back, he's in first class. And I'm with the rabble. And uh, so I'm heading in the back and I go back up to him. I, I never did this, but this was back in the drinking days. So I had a little liquid courage. Yeah, right. And I went up to him and I was like, man, I never do this. I've met so many people and never asked for a picture, but I'd love to get a picture with you because I was a big Van Halen guy. Yeah. And uh, he was so gracious. He's like, let's not like do right here because all the other passengers, I don't want to. He goes, when we get off the plane, I'll just wait for you in the terminal. And then when you get off, we'll take the pictures. I said, really? He's like, yeah, totally, man. Dude, the guy was probably the first person off the plane. He waited for like 10 minutes for me outside, you know, the gate right there, sitting on the wall, Sammy Hagar waiting for me. Cool as <laughs> shit. <laughs> His foot against the wall, you know, leaned back against the thing. And he sat there and he took pictures with me and my friends. And I just never forgot that. That was so gracious and cool. Yeah, that is cool. And uh, so, yeah, no, that was good times, man. Wow. We're just sharing. We're just swapping stories. Yeah, dude. It's so funny. I love Sammy Hagar. He did a, they did an album, Balance, I yeah. want to say. You remember Balance? That was their last one. Yeah, like I listened to that with my dad, dude. That was so cool. And Sammy Hagar had all those like... <laughs> You know, he had all these like <laughs> things Hagar he did. Yeah, yeah. Hagarisms. And oh my gosh, we love that. Yeah. Such good memories with that uh with that album. Yeah, he was a good dude. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Do you still have those pictures? I do. And they're old school, so I don't have any digital copies. Oh man. So I, I think I have one floating around because I'll find it every once in a while. I'll go, Oh, gotta hold on to this. This is the Hagar photo, and then gone again for another couple years. And then Okay. <laughs> Well, I'll bring it. We'll put it up as the uh, the picture for this. I episode. know where it is now. I have, <laughs> I have my hands on it now, so I'll definitely I'll bring it in. So, what about uh, Tom Cruise? Cruise, you know, Cruise takes a lot of heat. Number one, I I anybody who knows me, I I'm a big Tom Cruise guy, not just because of the story I'm about to tell you, but because he's been doing it since I was a little kid, and I'm old, and he mm. was a huge star when I was a little kid. 
and he's still going strong, still making huge movies. Still, I mean, like, how many stars are actually still making movies? Not doing Netflix even or anything like that. No, no knocks. Yeah, yeah. But he's a cinema purist, and he's been doing it forever, and he loves doing it, and it shows. I don't care what he believes in. I don't care about any of that stuff, dude. Just keep making Mission Impossibles, and I love you forever, brother. Talk to me, Goose. So anyways, I was at one point, uh, Rosie O'Donnell had a show that uh, kind of preceded Ellen DeGeneres' show. So okay. before that was like the Rosie O'Donnell show. And then Telepictures was this company, which is owned by Warner Brothers. And then they moved to Ellen. But before that, it was Rosie O'Donnell. And you probably don't remember it, but that was a really big show in the 90s. It was like a huge talk show, like daytime talk show. It was like Ellen. Yeah. But <clears throat> she loved Tom Cruise, you know, loved him, famously loved him. And she came out to do a show in L.A. once, and I was her production coordinator. So she came out and did a, a show for a whole, with a whole, a whole show on Tom Cruise for an hour. It was a special thing. Mm -hmm. Went to him on the set of Mission Impossible 2 or in the editing bay on 20th Century Fox lot. Spent the whole day with him, and it was just a handful of us. And Tom Cruise, who was just like so chill i couldn't believe because i was like this guy's kind of he's gonna be but still you're a little enamored he's my height number one mm. in like in like heels. i thought he was like four inches shorter than you or something mm. i thought i would think he might tower be an over him. inch shorter than me i think okay. he's about five eight so okay um but he had like thick shoes on regardless <clears throat> the, the man is tall in stature that's all i have to say uh, and he couldn't have been cooler. He was like, and it wasn't a, like, I didn't feel at any time that he was an act. Like, so unless he's the best sociopath on the world, like he would talk to me and he was engaged and he was like looking right at me. I mentioned my sister's name, like early on in the day, like four hours later, he's like, so Kendra, tell me about Kendra. She, she's, what, she, what, what grade is she teaching again? And he was just like, would bring up conversation. He's like, my sister and I remain so close and I still work with her. And dude, I, mm. I just walked away just thinking this guy was the, the coolest, you know, nicest, most gracious guy. And, uh, yeah, I just, I buy into the hype, man. He can jump on couches all day long as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. He, he, I've always liked him as an actor and he does have like a whole religion built around him. And like, people who do everything for him you know i mean it seems yeah. like kind of a nice life <laughs> i pretend like it, that doesn't exist i try to not think but then the funny thing is he didn't have any of that the day that we were with him it was just him he came because he was already mm. on the lot doing the stuff yeah and john woo who directed he's like a legendary sure i know so i get to go into the editing bay and see them cutting this movie that the way that and them talking about cuts that they're going to take out before and it was so cool man wow surreal that's Once trippy. again, trickling downward, trickling, <laughs> trickling into antiquity. Yeah, that's, that's the way it, where we're all going, right? No, I love it. It's great, dude. It, it's life's a journey, not a dest, a nash. Nice. Why did I shorten destin destiny? Why do I shorten? That's what the cool everything? kids are doing. All these kids are shortening everything. My my sis, my daughter. The big word is like sus. Like, oh, they're a little sus. I'm like sus. Sus or suspect. suspect. Oh my gosh. Or suspicious. That's, That's funny. Sus. So what's your story, man? You got something to share with yeah, us. Yeah, I I this is actually this is not a personal story, but there was a story on CNN, which is pretty awesome. Uh it was making the rounds on the health forums and Twitter a week ago. So I don't know, maybe you saw it. Um, but it was about a guy named Doug Lindsay. And this is a crazy story of recovery and experimentation and all that. So right. basically, Doug, after his first day of college classes in his junior year in 1999, so we're going back to the 90s, uh, he was 21 years old. On that day, he collapses, right? And he's intense dizziness, heart racing, oh total weakness, um, just in bad shape. And the symptoms were so intense that he was literally bed bound. You know, he could only walk 50 feet per day. Uh, and that was generally to the bathroom and maybe to the kitchen and back to bed before, you know, just being totally weak, That's collapsing it. with weakness, you know, unable to do much heart racing. You know, he'd have to, he'd lay down, his heart would get up to like 160 beats per second. And he wasn't second. obese? No, wasn't, he was a big, he was a real skinny guy. Oh, that's right. You didn't yeah. mention the skinny part. Did I? 
I don't think I said he was skinny. Okay, you didn't. He's 21 though. Okay. I mean, in college, so I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this was the 90s, so not everybody was fat back then. <laughs> <laughs> Just the cool ones like us. Yeah. So this wasn't the first time it's shown up for him either. I think his mother had had similar illnesses. Uh, when he was Doug was 18 years old, she could she was, could barely carry him because of how weak she was. And when he was four years old, she could no longer walk, and so she became bed bound for the rest of her life. Aye. And similarly, Doug's aunt had the same problem, and she was so weak that after a certain point in her life, she couldn't even like tie her own shoelaces. That's terrible. So it's obviously some type of like hereditary illness, right? It's something that's like running in their family. And as far as what it is, they weren't really sure. Uh, the Mayo Clinic told Doug's mom that it was some type of thyroid disorder, uh, but they didn't really do extensive testing after that, so they didn't really know what it was. Mm. So when the same illness kind of struck Doug, he was determined to figure out what it was. Uh, now, Doug, he went to a lot of different specialists in endocrinology, uh, neurology, internal medicine, you name it, and none of them found anything conclusive, and eventually they just referred him to a psychiatrist and said, you know, your, your problem's in that department, at which point Doug realized that, you know, he's going to have to get himself out of this this business. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So this is what I love about this story. Doug, he's totally out of options from the medical establishment, and so he decides that he's going to do it on his own. And what follows is really like an 11-year journey of experimentation, research, trying to figure out what's wrong with him and what he can do about it. And it starts with this massive endocrinology textbook. And so Doug reads this thing, and after reading it, he discovers that sometimes adrenal dysfunction can look a lot like thyroid dysfunction. So he theorizes that there was a whole category of autonomic nervous system disorders that could exist beyond the regular categories that were used by endocrinologists and neurologists and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So he gets a computer. He starts reading online about different groups and conferences and uh, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And he finds these conferences that study autonomic nervous system disorders. And so he wants to attend one of these conferences and present his theory. Okay. Now you have to remember he doesn't, even have a bachelor's degree. Remember, he was in school, uh, so he had to drop out when all this stuff struck. Okay. So he's completely uneducated and just winging it, really. So oh. he sh he sh <laughs> right. <laughs> he shows up at this conference in a wheelchair, but like dressed really well, and he presents himself as a Jesuit trained scientist who is going to give a talk on theories around his illnesses. <laughs> so he presents so well that the doctors and Harvard trained scientists at the conference they they give him respect and they yeah. they consider his ideas seriously just because he put on this act kind yeah of? he's like i'm a scientist and i'm i'm looking at he didn't come as a patient basically he right. didn't come like i'm sick and this is what i think's wrong with me what do you guys think he came <laughs> as a scientist like okay i've been studying this illness now for so and so and he presents his theories and right. stuff like that and they're like oh wow and they listen to him and give him respect now they all reject it they, they say it's all <laughs> they, they tell him it's total crap okay yeah uh, of course but after the talk, one doctor, his name was, uh, let me see, Dr. H. Cecil Coughlin, he approached Doug and he said, well, you might be onto something with your theory. So Doug thought that his, this is basically the theory, his adrenal glands were producing too much adrenaline. That That's the bottom line. It's, it's more complicated, but that's what he thinks, okay? okay? And what he needed was a doctor who would work with him and prescribe him certain drugs that Doug thought might help and be an ally and basically discovering a way out of this disease. And you have to remember, doctors, they're very conservative in trying new things. Okay. If they start experimenting yeah. and prescribing drugs for off-label use, they can easily lose their license. Mm. So doctors, they tend to stay within the lines from fear that all the time and effort that they put into getting their license will evaporate if they step poorly. Especially now. Especially now. And these licenses, they're worth millions of dollars. Over, over your lifetime, maybe tens of millions. I don't know, but they're worth a lot. So they really do everything to not risk that, which doesn't make a great environment for discovering, you know, new approaches to things, <laughs> but, you know, it is what it is. Anyway. That's <laughs> uh, why we're in this mess. That's right. So anyway, this Dr. Coughlin, he was taking a risk to help Doug out. And they did all kinds of tests. They tried different drugs, and actually they had some success. So Doug was put on a drug called Levofed, uh, which counteracted the adrenaline that was constantly being pumped into his system by his adrenal glands. Yeah. Now, remember, this is the theory, and this had never been done before, but it actually worked, and Doug got some of his life back. Now, he still he had to basically be on a constant IV drip of this, so it's not fun. I mean, he, he couldn't really, like, go anywhere. Yeah. Um, 
but he wasn't confined to his house as much as he was. Um, so things were moving positively when he got on this drug. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So anyway, Dr. Coughlin, he also came up with a diagnosis. And after they did all these scans, eventually they theorized that part of the adrenal gland, it's called the medulla, was acting like a tumor and pumping out adrenaline constantly. Now, the medulla, it's inside the adrenal glands. You can almost think of it like an egg yolk in the middle of a hard-boiled egg. Yeah, that made me almost throw up in my mouth when you described the the medulla as like an (laughs) egg Oh, God. Okay, continue. (laughs) Because you made that fist thing too that they couldn't uh, you see. That can't, I yeah, you this can't see crazy egg. Yes, uh, continue, sir. Anyway, it's called bilateral adrena med- medullary hyperplasia. Of course, and there's only ever been 32 cases of it ever diagnosed. And so, <sighs> you can imagine, you know, this diagnosis was doubted heavily by the whole professional community far and wide. But Dr. Coughlin, he put his reputation on the line. He backed it. And anyway, after further research, Doug, he came to the conclusion that the only way to move forward was to have the medulla, medullas and his adrenals removed. Oh, brutal. Right? They're they're acting like a tumor, and they're putting out adrenaline all the time. And so he's like, all right, we got to take them out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the only problem was this was not a surgery that was practiced or <laughs> no. even existed. What could go wrong? Right? Removing the medullas in the adrenal glands, it's apparently it's not necessary. And so there's no methodology <laughs> of removing them. I don't mean to laugh at, at this morbid story, but at the same time, I'm like, oh, it sounds gnarly. It is gnarly. So at this point, it's 2008, right? Yes. And Doug, he's been researching and testing since 1999, so almost 10 years, you know, and he's looking for any info he can on how to remove the medullas. And he finally gets a big lead when he discovers a doctor who operated on rats in the 1980s and was able to extract medullas from a rat adrenal gland. Oh my God. And I'm going to describe how this, how this worked for I you. I can't <laughs> So the surgery, it was described, you basically slice open the adrenal with a razor and you squeeze it so the medulla pops out, almost oh. like kind of popping a pimple. <laughs> that's right. Oh. So that's the surgery. Oh, now, ratatouille. Oh, now Doug also discovered a similar surgery done on cats in the early 1920s, as well as dogs. I I didn't really look into why that was happening, but you know I'm a lot of things happened in the 1920s. Either. So he's definitely getting some info, but Doug isn't exactly getting the type of info that you know he could take to a surgeon and be taken seriously. So Doug decides to pioneer this new form of surgery and try and get a surgeon who would be willing to perform it on him. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> so he built a 363-page PDF in which he proposed the first ever human adrenal medullectomy. Now, if you thought getting a doctor to prescribe you drugs off-label was difficult, try and get a surgeon to perform a new untested surgery on what you. What jungle is this guy going into <laughs> to get this surgery done? Right? Yeah. So surgery, it's its so risky, you know, especially if complications arise. It's very easy for a surgeon to lose their license. Not only that, surgeons, they're super clicky, I guess, and so they all know each other. Of course. So if one surgeon you know says, how they are. You know, no, no, it's too risky. Other surgeons are going to be like, oh, okay, I'm not doing it either. So Doug, he has to be really careful how he presents uh, this surgery so that he didn't have all the door slam in his face yeah. all at once. So I imagine... I, I, I mean, just, you would think that if they sign something saying, I'm not liable for anything that is... I mean... Couldn't you come up? You would think that there would be some kind of legal document you could come up with where they're like, listen, I'm going to do this, but I am not liable at all for the results of this because it's never been done before. Wouldn't you think? You'd think, but you know, then it's got to be at a hospital or a university. But th- does the AMA and- crack down on you and go, you can't, you just lost your license because you went outside the AMA too? Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't know either. We'll get back to you guys on that. Yeah. I don't know. We don't, I don't know any surgeons to ask either. So they're great great hilarious a hilarious bunch so doug he has to be really careful right and how he presents his surgery so that he doesn't have all the doors slam in his face all at once and i imagined like doug going down dark alleys kind of and he has this like ivy drip in tow like whispering to surgeons hey bro 
you know, you heard of the first ever adrenal <laughs> medulectomy? Shh, you know, keep it on the down low. Anyway, <laughs> so it took Doug 18 months to find a surgeon. Where did he find the surgeon? He, he finally did. The, the name of the surgeon was not given, <laughs> which I thought was funny. <laughs> but it was in 2010 at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. He went into surgery and had one of his medu- medulas extracted successfully without complications. Oh, and so this was in September. Giving me anxiety just hearing about this. This was in September. And three weeks after the surgery, he was able to sit up in a sitting position for three hours for the first time in years. Wow. And then by Christmas, he could walk a mile to his church. That's incredible. From just having one removed. Just one removed, yeah. And then in 2012, he went and did the other surgery without complications. He had the other medulla removed. And a year later, he was well enough to fly with his friends to the Bahamas and party it up a bit. What? Right? From just getting the medullas extracted? Yeah, that was the, that was the cause. His and medullas. he was the champion of his own surgery. There you go. Why isn't this a movie yet? Right? It should be. So by 2014, he was able to come off some of the meds he was on. Sadly, in 2015, Dr. Coughlin died, uh, but he lived long enough to see this amazing recovery. And it was because Dr. Coughlin kind of, I mean, oh, dude, that's great. This is a script, right? And this, uh, the, that's how my mind works. You're so I'm thinking. going, I'm like, you said Coughlin. I go, who are we going to get to play Coughlin? <laughs> <laughs> that's got to be, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? Morgan Freeman. <laughs> Andy Dufresne. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it was without his medullas. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, Doug, he eventually graduated with a biology degree 16 years after he was supposed to have originally graduated. And these days, his health is not perfect. He's still on something like nine meds, uh, but he can live his life without being in a bed or a wheelchair. And his story and experiences have brought him a lot of opportunities. So he goes around and gives talks and consults doctors on patients and in on ways to basically handle rare and mysterious diseases. Why do you think he went back? I mean, he had such favorable results with the first operation why do you think he rolled the dice and got that second one was he still having major complications i mean i'm sure he was still pretty sick and both of them were acting like tumors yeah on this on these scans and okay. so that makes sense you know it's he could walk a mile but he wasn't you know doing great it's quality of life yeah quality of life so okay well anyway i probably would have made the same decision i would have too he uh he has a real gift apparently, of solving intractable problems. So uh, people are hiring him to try and help out with rare diseases. The only difference, uh, if this was my story, yeah, I would go in there and go, I want my d- medulas out. And the doctors go, we can't do that. I'd go, okay. And then I would have just gone home. It wouldn't have been the same <laughs> yeah. movie that we got with good old Doug. Yeah, well, that's why I love this story. Is This guy basically, through research and hard work, was able to discover this rare ailment that was affecting him and then develop a drug therapy and eventually pioneered a new surgery to save himself. That is the greatest. I mean, what can you say about that? That is the greatest. You know, and he did it all while confined to a bed as well. (sighs) There won't be a dry eye in the house (laughs) when you make this movie. (laughs) I I have so much admiration for this guy. Yeah, that's great. That's a great story, man. Yeah. I feel like you told this great inspiring story and I was telling stories about uh like i was name dropping <laughs> yeah but i go sammy hagar he sang songs and he's pretty and he's he waited for pictures yeah but you know this was from cnn this was a curated story from around the world like you know that's great dude i love that story yeah and i can't believe i'm probably the first person in history that ever referred to sammy hagar as pretty yeah i don't know where you're going with that yeah he did have blonde hair i guess yeah yeah so did i at one point so i'll link to this article um he also gave a ted talk that was pretty good and we'll give some more pictures and details on his story doug not his, sammy hagar yeah not sammy hagar <laughs> um, let's make that clear so if you want to be inspired check I, it out dude that was a great story i love that yeah I, I don't know it's kind of like us too you know it's like well i mean obviously we're not in doug's position but it's kind of like a lot of people who are outside the medical system looking for answers looking to figure things out right and, yeah, so it's really inspiring. Because every day there's some kind of, oh, this is good for that. And so the more we keep looking, the more we're going to keep finding if we spend our attention in the right direction. Definitely. So I had one more thing. Uh, it was a news article from Merkula that just popped up. And okay. I thought it was interesting. So 
it was a cool article and it was about how much time you spend in nature. I think most people they've heard that uh, spending time outside in nature is good for us in many different ways. It lowers stress, it ups the happy chemicals in our brain. You've mm. heard that, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So there's a lot of studies that show that it's beneficial, you know, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, lots of more diseases all helped by being outside in nature. Yeah. And what I liked about this article is it quantified how much time in nature was actually useful. So this study was published in the journal called Scientific Reports, and it surveyed almost 20,000 people who spend time in nature on a weekly basis. So the study, it's a self-reporting study where they ask people, you know, how they feel and their time outside, that kind of thing. So, you know, not the most rigorous of scientific discoveries, but it could be possibly useful. And the survey found that the optimal time to spend in nature each week was two hours or 120 minutes. When you go over 120 minutes, the benefits start to drop off and even become negative when you get between two and 300 minutes. Why? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't know why I didn't look up why that was, but I imagine it's like some people don't like camping or I, I don't know. So, so maybe stress stress or, or stress on your body because your body's like this too much. It's hot or, yeah, y- totally. y- you know, it's like if you're looking at July 4th and you're going to go see... Um, I don't know. You're you're sitting in the grass outside and you're watching fireworks. You know, after two hours, aren't you kind of done? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know that that was no, that, that was sense. my idea. I don't know if that makes. I don't know if that's true or not. Now, those 120 minutes, they don't need to be done all at once. It can be separated into chunks throughout the week. And if you go out in nature each day, it's only about 17 minutes for the week, which is not bad. What constitutes nature? Is that even like the desert out yeah. there? So other studies have shown that the benefits from spending time in nature are higher when the biodiversity in nature is higher. Okay. So more herb, herbs, birds, plants, butterflies. Trees, I'm sure. The trees. oxygenation is a factor. Yep. The more, the better, basically. Okay. All right. So anyway, I thought that was cool. There's more in-depth recommendations in the article, like exercise and meditation, if you're interested. Yeah. So so go outside and play, but not too much. Not too much. You'll get unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> I love being outside. I do too. I feel, feel like feel I'm good. not doing it as much. Well, it's summer right now. True. I can't wait until it cools down. It's right around the corner. Yeah. I can't believe it's August. I know. We're not going to talk about the weather, though. Well, no. <laughs> we didn't. <laughs> we didn't. <laughs> All right. Anyway, do you have anything else you want to chat about? No, man. I'll come up with some more uh, benign anything celebrity sighting stories. Anything interesting happen at the store, like customer-wise? Have you guys been pretty slow right now? I think everybody's kind of slow, but we've always got people in and out of there. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, a lot of people are coming in for digestive stuff right now. So I don't hmm. know if that means a lot of people are having digestive issues, but I've never seen so many people ask for psyllium husk in my life. Really? Yeah. Every other person, it seems like I'm talking to them, bring them back to get psyllium. Did, That's strange. Yeah. Did they do something? Al Roker talk about psyllium or something recently? <laughs> <laughs> the Al Roker set is coming in for psyllium. <laughs> Anyways. Anyways. That's just, you know, All right. o- older folks in general. Yeah. But- cool, man. Okay. Yep. Thanks very much. And uh, head over to www.quackspodcast.com. Help us out by shopping through Amazon through us. Share if you like it. And uh, we appreciate you guys listening. And we hope you're staying cool out there. Thanks a lot. Be with.